here we go. So, how many of you would sort of uh, how many of you would like to go to production with an application that is, you know, beautiful, scalable, highly concurrent, meeting all the SLAs in the world, um, high throughput, low latency, yada 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 yada. You raise your hand. Yeah, we all do, right? The problem, though, is that none of that matters unless your application is actually up, unless it's actually able to serve its purpose and serve its users. Without resilience, nothing else matters. I'm, I'm really honored and, and, and grateful to be here. Thanks for the invite, Francesco. Uh, I started ACA a long time ago now, eight years ago, and I have to say that without Erlang, there would be no ARCA. I'm, I'm immensely grateful for all the hard work that you've done. I mean, I'm learning so much from people like, like Joe, Francesco, and many others in the community here, and trying to take your, your sort of foundation forward. In, in sort of Erlang, when I found it, was like a lightning rod, you know, in the, in the dark, scary forest. I was lost, I had nowhere <laughs> to go, really, and it showed the way. Unfortunately, I was not able to continue using it, though, but it showed what was possible. And that sort of later led to me trying to re-implement those on the JVM that led to ACA, et cetera. So some of you might sort of might recognize, so sorry, I just need audio. Sorry, I just need to get pulled out for some reason. Some of you might recognize this, the intro, the intro song here. It was from, you know, if you didn't, it was from the first Rocky movie. You know, Rock is about this underdog. He gets a shot at the title. The media, you know, sort of boosts him up, calling him the in Italian stallion, etc. And one of the most memorable quotes from that movie is this one. Or actually, from. How hard would it be? It's about how hard you think they did. They keep moving forward. How much you think they keep moving forward? That's how good it is done. Yeah, don't we love Rocky, right? Uh, it's actually not, not from this movie, it's from the one, of one of the later series, but it sort of captures the, sort of the whole theme of, of the Rocky series quite well. This is fault tolerance. I mean, you, you get hit, you survive, you limp along, hopefully, eventually, you will win, right? But often you don't, and in the first movie, Rocky didn't actually. He got knocked out of the ring. The problem is that fault tolerance is not a sustainable strategy, okay? What we need, and what this talk is all about, is resilience. What it is, why it's needed, how other industries sort of de deal with it, and what we can learn from that, et cetera, et cetera. So what is resilience? Uh, so if you go to Merriam-Webster and look up the definition of resilience, it says that it's the ability of a substance or object to spring back into shape, to recover, the capacity to recover quickly from difficulties. It's really to be able to restore full functionality, not just to limp along like Rocky, but actually to not just survive, but to fully self-heal and be back where you were where you, where you, when, when you got hit. There's a lot of people talking nowadays about anti-fragility as well, be able to, whenever you take a hit, you grow stronger. I don't think we as an industry are really ready for that yet, but it's an interesting concept. And the software systems today are incredibly complex. Here are some diagrams that sort of been circling around the internet the last few years. Netflix architecture, Twitter's architecture, etc. These are, of course, exceptional cases, right? But, but it shows uh, a lot with what we're dealing with here. So I really believe that we need to study resilience in complex systems and under really understand what that means. But what is complex then, and how is it different from complicated? A lot of people confuse the two. So a complicated system usually consists of very, a lot of small parts, all usually different, uh, but that each one has sort of a precise role in the machinery. Okay? It is possible, however, often quite hard, as in this picture. I can look at this one forever. I won't let you do that. So <laughs> uh, uh, but it is possible to fully understand a complex a complicated system. A complex system, however, is made up of many sort of indi sort of similar interacting parts 
with simple individual rules, and it's the interaction of these rules that leads to globally consistent behavior. And it's by definition impossible to understand a complex system. That leads in, at least to some, 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 de some sort of definition. You can only try to understand a complex system by understanding the underlying rules in how these parts interact. <coughs> one, one example, for example, is Game of Life. It doesn't look that complex. It, it, it has a ver set of very, very simple rules, right? But when you scale it up, it generates an, an immensely complex behavior that is close to, that is, I would argue, almost impossible to understand, even though it's extremely simple in terms of look at the just the individual rules. So it's really important to understand that complicated is not equal to complex. And probably one of the most important pieces of wisdom in this talk is, is, is from this great paper by, ri by Richard Cook called How Complex Systems Fails. Richard is an MD, he's been doing research in in medical systems and resilience in medical systems for, for years. He's actually still located here in Stockholm. And uh, he says that complex systems run in degraded mode. Complex systems run as broken systems. In a non-trivial complex system, something is always failing somewhere. It's a fact. And it's too hard to understand how and why, etc. So we need different strategies. Also, Donella Meadows, she's been doing a lot of research on, on system thinking, and she, she writes about the points for human intervention in the system, in the complex system, where humans go in and, you know, f and fiddle with things. She calls them leverage points. And I quote, counterintuitive, that's Forrester's word to describe complex system. Leverage points, meaning points where humans go in and fiddle with things, are not intuitive. Or if they are, we as humans then intuitively use them backwards, systematically worsening whatever problem we're trying to solve. I mean, humans generally just makes things worse. So we really need good models in order to understand fa what failure means and, and, and especially how failure behaves itself in complex systems, why it happens and what, and what we can do ab about it. And since software systems are incredibly complex and systems always complex systems always run as broken systems, we need to learn to fully embrace failure, I believe. We need to learn to design for failure from the start, find ways of managing it. The most fundamental lesson in this talk, I believe, this is, is that resilience is by design. It's nothing that you can just bolt on afterwards. You, you build your beautiful app, and then, oh yeah, resilience. Yeah, we just turn on, you know, I don't know, web logic clustering if you're running on Java or whatever. It needs to be part of the design from day one. Yeah, it's, it's, it's a core concept. This is a photo from, from, a, from a home in Gilchrist, Texas. It is, it's a home that was designed to, to, to sort of resist floodwaters. And then when Hurricane Ike came in in 2008, you know, the whole city was wiped out, more or less. This, this, this house st still stood strong because it was built with resilience in mind from day one. So let's now look at some patterns and some sort of strategies how to, how to manage failure and increase stability. <coughs> Um, Mark Burgess, he's, he's a professor in, 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 uh, at the Oslo University. He, he wrote in his book, In Search for Certainty, which is a great book, I really recommend you to read it, that autonomy makes information local, leading to greater certainty and stability. And one thing that you will learn in this talk is that autonomy, is, I believe, is the key to resilience. Building autonomous systems, you know, collaborative components that are decentralized and so in the, in the, and that's so that so, so they can sort of be self-managed itself, in a way. And uh, Mark Burgess, you know, he also introduces this theory in this book and other, other, other books called Promise Theory. And I really believe it's a, it's a really, I recommend you to read this book. It really g gives a solid foundation how to think and understand sort of complex and collaborative systems made out of autonomous components. You know, we're used to thinking in terms of obligations and, 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 and sort of impositions and what we call usually what we call com commands, that we one process tells another process what to do. Okay, so what's, what, but what's wrong with that, if something's wrong with it? Yeah, the, problem is, the, the thing is that promises, on the other hand, you know, they are local. You take local uh, sort of decisions, what you can promise to the rest of the world. Okay, while obligations and commands, they are non-local. They're distributed, by definition, non-local. And since you can only control local information, the stuff that you actually sit on, you, know, you can't control others. 
commands sort of make us lose control. It leads to, to just sort of a lower degree of, of certainty and stability. And the promises express this sort of intent of what to do at, at, an, at an end point, defining the ultimate outcome, what we want to happen. Okay, and that's sort of independent of current status. While commands, on the other hand, sort of the, they, sort of they define what to do at the starting point, but not sort of um, what, what the end out, outcome necessarily will be. So, and you know, convergence is a, is a topic in, in, in physics, and, con and, con and convergence can ideally lead to sort of stable fixed point. You know, stability in complex systems is a really good thing. Okay, why divergence leads to instability. And the interesting is the commands, you know, they start with a definite, with, with, with a certain state, but they diverge out to uncertain states. That leads to sort of decreased stability and certainty in the system. While promises, on the other hand, they usually start from, from unpredictable beginnings that lead you, converge into a, a stable state in the system. And, and convergence is actually the same thing as idempotence that, that we uh, in, in computer science, you know, really really treasure since if we have arrived it means like when we've arrived at a desired outcome then do nothing we're already there okay so let's now take a look this is just some food for thought that 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 that, that i uh, that really helped sort of frame my way of thinking and especially in discerning protocols which is the essence real of distributed systems so let's look at how some, how uh, just briefly how some other sciences or like fields manage Resilience. First, look at resilience in biological systems. One of the interesting stories that I, that I learned as at a TED talk by a guy called Nicholas Peroni was that when he, he that, that TED talk I recommend you to watch it. It's just ten minutes long. He to, he talks about complexity theory and he he's doing s studies on, on 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 animals in the animal kingdom. And, th and this particular sort of study was on meerkats. And meerkats, they are apart from sort of being sort of funny and cute. I just love them. <laughs> They're quite, quite interesting animals. They're very social animals with, with, with very rich social behavior, so they're really interesting to study. And wha one, one thing, for example, is that it's only the dominant couple in a, in a, in a big group that is allowed to have, to have children. All the rest in the group need to sort of serve as mm, servants or babysitters once they get kids, etc. And in, in this particular experiment, GPS trackers were added to the meerkats. And they were observed moving from one, one feeding place to the next. And interesting that there was a road in between. So you, so you, you could then follow, sort of see how the, 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 the dominant female, she led the group all the way up to the road. And then she stopped. And then she sort of gave, sort of gave way to, to the subor subordinates. To, to sort of to look like let them to test if it's safe to cross the road. If they got run over, yeah, sure, it's fine. She was still doing okay, right? And if it was safe, she also crossed the road and then took charge of the group again and led them to you know to find food. And same thing on the on the w on the way back. And it and what's interesting is that you know nature has sort of developed this way, this this sort of behavior for thousands of years, probably hundreds of thousands of years, millions of years, perhaps. You know, the dominant female is extremely important to the group. It's only that she, she that can have children. So that's why, that's why the group sort of sacrifices itself for the greater good of the group, than, and in this case, the, 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 the dominant female. A and this is like as a way to improve resilience of the group as a whole. So I, I find that quite interesting. We'll, co we'll, co we'll come back to this pattern. Nicholas Peroni sums up his talk with this quote that, in three worlds, in the animal kingdom, simplicity leads to complexity, which leads to resilience. I think it's interesting that nature uses complexity to achieving resilience as a way to resilience. I think we can learn a lot from that. And, uh, and let's now look at uh, one example from resilience in social systems. That's also quite interesting. Uh, this is from this paper, Dealing in Security, Understanding Vital Services and, the, and How They Keep You Safe. I don't know if you've seen it. It's quite an interesting paper. It it's essentially describes you, first, as an individual, and then that there are six, sorry, six ways to die, essentially. Okay? That's where the pie slices in this in in diagram. You can either die from being too hot, too
to cold, hunger or thirst, illness or injury. Okay? Then we have sort of three sets of essential services that protect us from dying. Shelter, pr protect us from dying from being too hot and too cold. We have supply, the pr pr the, the, that helps with hunger and thirst. And then we have safety, that helps with illness and injury. And so these, these, these services then are laid out in layers, you know, protecting us as individual in the, in, the, in, the, in the innermost center of the circle. So starting from, 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 from the outer circle, for example, first we have the, the, the world. There we have a global markets like you know, energy markets, food markets, fuel market, country, we have this thing called the military, perhaps, regional, we have police, city, we have like hospitals, water plants, etc. Neighborhood, we have like food shops, grocery stores, you know, 7-Eleven, gas stations, etc. Home, yeah, we have heating, toilet, tap water, these times that we, these things that we take for granted, all the way down to the individual. And you know, it takes quite a big of, of, of a catastrophe in order for everything to break down and you to die. It happens still. But, uh, but, but it's really interesting how the world is laid out in layers, protecting us as, as individuals to achieve higher resilience for us as a species, okay? We'll also come back to this a little bit later. So what can we learn from biological and social systems? Yeah, first they, they feature diversity and, red and, re and redundancy. You know, systems with many different components are generally a lot more resilient than systems with few components, simply because if certain components die, then others can make up for that, sort of take over their, their work. Etc. That's how you know brains work and everything. If you get brain injury, injury, I mean, other other parts of the brain can actually learn the what you what you lost to some extent, etc. So this leads to redundancy, and that's a good thing. This is sort of an insurance policy, you may say. These systems also, according to some of the papers I've read, you know, have in and always an, inter in an interconnected network structure. They are decentralized, made up of autonomous components. They usually display a wide range of of structures across a lot of s different scales, fine-grained scales all the way up to large scales. And also they have the capacity to self-organize and to self-adapt, which is also a core trait that I think we can learn a lot from in computer science. So let's look a little bit now from, from I mean the remainder of the talk that about resilience in computer science and also try to weave in how we can learn some from some of the ideas in other fields. Unfortunately, I mean, in way too many times we react like that. It's like first not at all, and then with complete panic. Uh, but I really think that we need to fundamentally change the way we think about failure. Failure is inevitable. Failure is actually something that's natural. It's not something we enjoy, right, or like, but we, it's still natural. It's, uh, it's nothing exceptional about failure. It's really a, a natural state in the application's life cycle. Because you have start, you have stop, you have up, you update, pause. Just look at failure as being something like that. A completely natural state in the state machine of the, life of the application. And when you then end up in the fail state, there's nothing to worry about because you know exactly why you got here and how to get out of that state. So you sh we should design for failure and manage it instead, not trying to avoid it. So one of the core philosophies that I think is important is, is what is often called sort of crash, let it crash, you know, and, and crash only software, which is actually the name of a paper by this Candé and Fox. You see all the, the tight, so th the reference are at the bottom here if you're interested in, in reading the papers. I have links at the end of the talk, by the way. So, so Candé and Fox, they, they define crash only software as, you know, so stop being crash safely and start to just recover fast. And this way of thinking can, can, can sort of help us escape non-determinism non thanks to inconsistent states and things like that. It's sort of a sledgehammer, I believe, but it's, 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 it's a useful one. And it's sort of something that's, of, of course, you know, you guys, Erlang developers, live and breathe. You know, let it crash, such. It's something that was also adopted in Akka. Candia Fox took this idea further in this, in this paper called Recursive Restartability, turning the crash on the sledgehammer into a scalpel, where, where they show how you can define this recursively, fine-grained all the way down to the tiniest components or vice versa, all the way up to, to largest type of systems. 
Uh, and that gives us an extremely good way of looking at systems, I believe. Something that we'll come back, come back to later. So, but first, I mean, let's, let's look at traditional state management. How are, how are we, you know, we as developers often taught? I mean, I, I'm, sp I'm preaching to the choir here a little bit, I know that. But uh, coming, I mean, most Java developers see C++ developers, etc. I mean, they, they are taught, you know, a very different way of looking at the world that I think is actually very, very, very harmful. In the legend here is that uh, this white ball is a client, blue is some, some sort of objects, and then you have your critical state that abso absolu they absolutely can't lose. That's this red square here, and the dotted line is sort of the thread boundary for a specific request, for example. So we have a bunch of scattered objects here. And you have cr critical state a little bit here and a little bit there. Okay? And then the client comes in and he makes a request to some, to some object. And if if you if if your sort of if the only concept of execution is the thread, then you will make a bunch of sort of synchronous calls down this object hierarchy. Okay, all fine, you know. Un I mean, the happy path is beautiful. It's really easy to understand. But what happens when things do don't go as expected? Okay. Then when th then then if if the if the if if, if one of these objects sort of blows up trickles, you know, it burns, you know, object after object of after object all the way up to the client, like blows the whole stack straight up into the client's face. So what should the, what should the client do? What the user do with this? That's non-trivial. And the problem here that, you know, you're only giving a th single thread of control. And if that, since that's all you have, you know, if that's lost, you lost everything. So what you need to do then is, is code extremely defensively, just holding on to the, on the context that you have. That's why we see, I mean, Java code literally with try catch statements, for example, coding extremely defensively, protecting the context that you have. And, and to make things even worse, you know, exceptions in Java, for example, uh, or, or C++ or, yeah, pick your poison, don't j sort of propagate between these threads. So unless you catch it and do something useful with it, it's just lost. No one will ever, ever know that something went wrong except this poor client that has no idea w what happened, you know? So, so, so it leads to very defensive programming, it has to, and it leads to programming that where failure matters is scattered across the whole application because something can go wrong anywhere. There's not a, a structured way of dealing with state, there's not a structured way of dealing with, with, with failure. I really believe this, this model is utterly broken and we need to look for other alternatives. So I think structure can bring sanity back here. Sidney Decker said that accidents come from relationships, not broken parts. I think this is also an extremely core piece of wisdom here. It's how things are connected that usually makes things fail in catastrophic ways. I mean, a single failure is usually fine if, it's if you can handle it the right way, okay? So what are my, my requirements for, say, in fa failure model? Yeah, again, this is from the Erlang cookbook, more or less. But I really believe that there's something way deeper here than just, some, th just Erlang. It's really the way we should think about failure, managing about failure. So I believe that failures first they need to be contained to avoid cascading failure. The failure should never be able to leak to what, I mean, without, without control. We see that way too many times in, 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 in Java and C++ applications. You need to be able to materialize, reify failures as messages. And if, especially if you're based on a fully message-driven system, then, then failure is just any other message, like any other message. You can treat it like any message. You can treat it almost as workflow. You know, that also changes the dynamics of how I look at failure. Failures need to be able to be signaled and in an asynchronous fashion, not synchronous. Then you still end up, you know, with this co blowing the whole call stack. You need to be able to ob be observed. And what's interesting, if you, if others can subscribe, you can have more than one subscribing to 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 message. You know, just like I mean, in 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 Aka we have something called watch, and you can subscribe to errors. It's not just the s sort of the the guy that created it, that that that, uh, the, that sort of that, that manages its life cycle, that can subscribe, but anyone can. And in Erlang, you have links, 
etc. And the interesting here that if you have this model and you can manage, you know, the failure from a safe context outside the failed component, since you have an asynchronous boundary between, you can see, you, and sometimes you have a network in between even, you, know, you can actually operate safely and manage the failed component. I think that's my cookbook for a sane failure model. First, I mean, look at isolation. We need to be able to contain failures to avoid them to leak, to avoid cascading failures, et cetera. And this is the key here is compartmentalization, containment of failure. And, and uh, the bulkheading is, you know, is, is a sort of a pattern that has, you know, a long story. It's been, it's, it's been the way that the ship industry, ship, ship construction industry have, have, have solved this problem for, uh, for hundreds of years where they sort of divide the ship into watertight compartments, so a bunch of them can actually be ripped, op or rip, rip, ripped open, but the failure is still contained. It doesn't, it doesn't leak. It doesn't spread taking down the whole ship. All people always bring up, yeah, what about the Titanic? It obviously didn't work that well. Yeah, the, the interesting thing with the Titanic is actually it's a perfect example of, of bulkheading gone wrong. These, you know, these walls didn't go all the way up to the roof. So when enough was uh, got, got sort of ripped open, the, the ship started tilting, it starts to, to spread over from one to the next. Like, so it's actually a perfect example of cascading failures and one you, why you should do bulletproof bulkheading. So, and so I believe this is a great way of achieving fault tolerance, but, but I think we can actually do better. We can bring resilience and self-healing into the picture and heal these, the, the, these bulkheads and restore full functionality as well. But this is not sufficient, right? We, we, we isolation is not is not it. We need a way for a failure to be signaled, observed, and managed as well, and that by healthier con uh, sort of com component. And what I really think we need something like supervision, where you have where you have someone that can sort of, ex sort of subscribe to these events and do something with the failure to m to manage the failed component. To this allows you to build systems that can truly self heal. Again, I'm preaching to the choir here, but, but uh, I'm telling my story. I also, I mean, you know, almost all failures are somehow related to state, to state management. I mean, inconsistent data, partial data, or the wrong data, lost data, duplication of data, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Right? So it can be helpful to try to classify state and, and, and this, this paper out of the tar pit, which is another great paper I recommended to read, defines state as two types of, of, of data. You have input data, that's data given to you by others, okay? And then you have derived data, data that you derive from the input that you get, okay? It's the input data that is the critical data, because that's nothing that you can recompute. If you lose the input data, you need to go and ask the client again or do another request to, 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 a, servi to a service or another system, et cetera. Derived data, however, that we can finally lose. The only thing you lose there is, is processing time, recomputing it, okay? This also ties a lot, of course, to immutable state and things like event logging I'll look at later. Out of the TARP, it also defines quite interesting, I think, the, their ideal system. You should take that with a grain of salt, of course, but I think they're onto something here, where they, they define an ideal system to be architected in three different layers. First, you have the essential state. That's where the foundation of the system, and that should, that's completely self-contained. It doesn't depend on anything. Okay. That's where we like put, for example, our input state, the state that we simply can't lose. Then you have the essential logic, that's sort of the heart of the system, often called the business logic, and that depends on the essential state, but nothing else. And then, and then, and then finally, we have what they call accidental state and control. This is sort of the least important part of the system, and that sort of depends on both, uh, on both of these. Um, but the interesting thing is the changes here can never affect either, either the essential logic or the essential state. So architecting this way, you have, you have a good foundation for managing state in a safe way. And uh, so what I, th what I think what, what this sort of describes, or what I'm getting at here, is that what, what I call onion-layered state management, a lot of people call in, in this community, I think, call it the error kernel pattern. There are, there are a couple of good 
good, uh, good links here. I mean, first, of course, Joe's paper here, but also J Jeff Branderson wrote a great post about this in more depth. But, but the interesting thing here is that instead of having, you know, the, the, the state scattered across the whole application, you define what sort of the error kernel, where you sort of the core where you put your essential state, and the state that you simply can't lose. And the interesting thing is that the kernel never does any dangerous operation by itself. It always sort of delegates to an, an outer layer to perform dangerous operations. This means that when the kernel is hit with a request, you can always assume correctness. It's always been validated. It's already the dangerous stuff has already been done in another thread or on another machine perhaps even, and it's always, always safe in to apply the new state or to apply the operation to the innermost of this error kernel. So let's look at an example here. The legend again is you have a client, you have an object, you have state that needs critical protection, etc. So now, instead of having the state scatter across the whole application, we, just, we put that in what we call the error kernel here. And then we have sort of layers where we sort of delegate uh, dangerous work. And the interesting thing is that for each one of these, each one of these sort of uh, layers, you have components that are all around in, the in their own thread. So you have sort of an asynchronous boundary bet between all of these. It's also extremely important to prevent from cascading errors and, ca and cascading failures. Okay. So let's now say that a client comes in here and, and, and does a request, and 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 something then blows up in the sec in the s in the second second layer. The interesting thing is that was that 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 failure will now be reified as a message. It was sent out to whoever subscribed it, usually the guy that created it, because that's that that's the component that created it, because that that's sort of in charge of managing the life cycle, but it can be others as well. The interesting that that component now can sort of, you know, manage failure by restarting the component, or you know, resuming it, or perhaps restarting it on another machine, or something like that. This gives us systems that sort of can very much self-heal. And the interesting thing is that this, I believe, this is very similar to how nature have evolved in terms of the of the meerkats, where you sort of delegate work dangerous work to subordinates that might go off and die but in this case you know the 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 dominant female represents the error kernel is still safe to continue to function and create n you know new uh, new actors or new components or new babies in the in the meerkats example and if you remember this is sort of this sort of this um, sort of diagram from dealing in secure insecurity where you have the individual being protected by layers all the way up you know this is exactly the way we are trying to model things here is that you have lever layers of defense protecting you from dying okay so i, fi I find that, that quite interesting so then are we done now can we go and have beers that's too early i guess but no, not really though, because we cannot keep putting all the eggs in the same basket. So the problem is that it's not, it's, it's not sufficient, okay? You remember the top lessons from, from, from sort of resilience in social and biological systems, that we need to maintain the di diversity and redundancy, we need to have an interconnected network structure, we need to have sort of decentralized, decentralized and autonomous agents. The same thing applies to computer systems, because you, know, you can never run a resilient system on a single machine. It doesn't matter if it's beautiful, you use error kernel patterns, etc. If it's on a single box, it's not resilient. Someone can go in, you know, with, this, with a sledgehammer, just cut the cut the wires, you know, connecting to the client, etc. Resilience really requires you to run at least two, I mean three, hundreds, depending on, 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 your, on your requirements, machines. Okay? Which means that we need to spread our application out on multiple nodes. And that completely changes the game. You know? We all know that network is reliable, right? Well, not really. 
and the the network you know is 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 where you have you you, you enter through sort of this world, this ocean, this, this ocean of complete non-determinism. You might be, have been archi architected your single application, your single node in the most beautiful way, even using strong consistency and stuff. But as soon as you enter the network, you know, you're jumping out of that, peeking out of that little box of beauty. I mean, everything that that's what we take for granted is lost. You know, because messages that can be, you know, delayed, reordered, dropped randomly, etc. That's how TCP works, you know? And failure detection is like a ar black art. It's a science, you know? It's, 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 uh, it's a guessing game. You can't be sure if a node is actually up and just being dead slow. Is the Java probably going DC, <laughs> do something like that? Or if it's down, it will never ever come up again. So you need to take an educated guess based on, on your heuristics, thresholds, etc. So it's, it's, I mean, and all these problems are, of course, not necessary if you're running a single, in, 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 a, in a single node. So what is the path then towards res sort of resilient distributed systems? Yeah, th that's a whole topic by itself for like probably a, a week, a week class or something like that. But, but some of the things that I, that I found useful for talk about just briefly is that and I will dive into a lot of these sort of in the, in the remainder of the talk, is that we need, you need to embrace the network. Don't try to hide it. Asynchronicity, location transparency is important. The isolation is as important, you know, as on a single machine, I believe, through, through, the or com through your components running in process. Autonomous microservices is, is something that can help. I mean, we can, serve, we can surf on the microservices trend and not just, you know, drink the Kool-Aid but actually use that in order to build systems that, that are distributed in the right way, I, I believe. There's a lot of people doing microservices wrong, but, um, but there, there's an opportunity to build distributed systems right there. Resilient protocols is, of course, extremely important. Building self-healing systems, you need things like decentralized architecture. I mean, Gaussian protocols have helped me a lot there. I mean, doing failure detection and stuff like that, and data resiliency. We need to start entering eventual and, and causal consistency. Things like event logging can help, and flow control, et cetera. But starting with, mic with microservices, I, I, I believe that these microservices, as I said, there's a lot of wrong ways of doing microservices, and just having some framework to sort of, that, 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 that scaffolding framework to just easily let you like spit out a single microservice. A uh, lot, lot of them do, you know. They, ign they ignore all the hard parts because this, with our microservices, you're actually supposed to enter the world of distributed systems, and that's hard. That's really hard. It's nothing you can just have a scaffolding framework to, to, to spit out. You need to really think through what, what you're doing here. But it's also an opportunity since, since the world, you know, is moving from monolithic to start thinking in, in, in distributed systems. It's an opportunity for us that, you know, that live and breathe distributed systems to show them the way, sort of lead them on the right path towards building that correctly. Some of the core traits of a microservices is, I said, autonomy, I think, is one of the biggest ones. Isolation is, of, of, of course, and, and you know, through, vir through, through virtualization and things, we actually are now allowed to have virtual isolation all the way down to the hardware, which is, which is also a good thing, using Docker containers or whatever. Mobility is also sort of a key, a key, a, a key aspect to this, I believe. M microservices need to be so a single unit that can move around, that can be replicated as you know, as s as one thing. And and uh, a lot of people, you know, they lock into the m to the micro in in the in in microservices. But it's really an unfortunate term, I believe. Microservice. It's a terrible chosen name because it's really nothing to do with micro. Micro implies size. It's nothing to do with size. I think it's it's about scope of responsibility, and and as I mean, we I mean most people that have been around the block a few times know the single responsibility is a good thing. That's how the that's a, that's a Unix philosophy. That's how we we were r sort of taught to build systems. So think about that. Think about scope of responsibility, and finally. Exclusive state, that's extremely important, I believe. First, I mean, to have, to have it be able to move around as a, sing as a single unit, but even more to have it be able to fail in isolation and, 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 and restored in isolation, etc. Then, then you need to make sure that you, that you own your state exclusively. 
not that it's sitting, you know, el elsewhere, wherever. Then it's really hard to maintain that data integrity needed as you scale your system, etc. Okay, and 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 uh, sort of looking at how to apply promise theory here, uh, I can just give just give you one one glimpse. This is Mark 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 Burgess, by the way. Uh, you know. What does promise theory then mean for autonomous microservices? Yeah, the interesting thing is that an autonomous service, you're looking at that is from from the, from the promise theory standpoint, can only promise its own behavior, never someone else's behavior. That's natural when you think about it. Else, if you can promise someone someone else, then it's coupled, and then it's not autonomous. But the interesting thing, I mean, this is you should sort of let that sink in, I believe, because I think it's, it has profound implications of how we think about systems. Because, you know, if a service can only promise its own behavior, then all the information needed to resolve, you know, conflict, to, to repair under failure scenarios, etc., that's available within the service itself. You, there's no need to go out and ask others for anything. You have all knowledge that you need to do that. So that minimizes, actually sometimes, com most of the time completely eliminates the need for coordination and communication with others. So, so, think, so, so I think autonomy is really the, the key here and promise theory can be an interesting lens. I won't, I won't oversell it, but it's an interesting lens to look at. We also need to sort of decompose the system in, in sort of consistency boundaries. So. What, what is the consistency boundary? Then, yeah, I, 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 I believe you know the, it is the boundary of, of, of the service that 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 you can have strongly consistent. They can have sort of transactional semantics, and the important thing is to try to minimize that as much as possible. Why? Yeah, you look at the monolith, then you've minimized it to, you know, not at all really. You know, you have one single global consistency, and and there's and that sort of then you have sort of a you, you, you have run out of options to scale. So if you try to minimize the scope of, 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 the, of the view that needs to be strongly consistent, then you open up for more possibilities of scaling and also more, of more, more sort of headroom for doing resilience, of course, so you can replicate it more easily, et cetera. So I think it's better to, st to, like to start with no guarantees when you design your system and then add just as much as you need and try to minimize you know, the transactional semantics of the, of, of the data that you, that you need. And then you add behavior. A lot of people do it the other way. They start with the behavior and then throw in everything that they want, you know, in order thinking that that, that, that that strong consistency is completely free and they end up with way too large consistency boundaries. And, and, and yeah, that, that com, com, comes back to bite them. It has a quite high price. Pat Helen defines a quite nice framework how to think about these things in his data on the inside versus data on the outside paper. We talked about inside data as our current local present. That's, that's our state, our internal state. Okay? That's the state where we can actually make strongly consistent. We can have one you know, single view on time not having to, you know, juggle different times, etc. cetera. Uh, outside data is what they call blast from the past. That's like facts arriving from somewhere else. You know, facts arriving from somewhere else are always from the past. You're always looking into the past when, when you're working with facts from the past. That's also important because you can only maintain strong consistency within your component. That means that outside all bets are off. Messages are delayed, you know, or whatever. So, 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 you have to juggle these two worlds. Between services is what he calls hope for the future, which is almost poetic, I think. <laughs> that's that's are your commands. W when you try, you send any position obligations, you know, that I talked about in promise theory. You ask someone to do something. You can never be sure that he will do it, but you can ask politely. Okay. So uh, I've said again, so I've, sa I've already said this, but I can just emphasize it again. Within the strong, within the consistency boundary, you know, we can have strong consistency. We just need to minimize it as much as possible. Things like bounded contexts in your theory in DDD can help modeling this. And this often goes hand in hand with microservice design and actors. In, I mean, Erlang and Arca and stuff. So. But, you know, between these boundaries, it's a lot harder. Because between these boundaries, it's a zoo, really. It's non-deterministic, and it should be. 
because it is the zoo that gives us tools for availability and scalability, I believe. It gives us more options, but it's extremely hard, right? Nothing's free, unfortunately. So to manage this zoo, I re we sort of need systems that are decoupled, and I believe they need to be decoupled in two, in two dimensions. First, in time, that is what gives us concurrency. It can give us a concurrency through interleaving or, or, or by running on multiple threads, etc. But this it, it gives us, like, to have to make tools that break free of this, of this strong coupling that we have. You as Erlang developers, you already know this, of course. That's what you live and breathe. But, but for way too many developers, it's not something that feels normal to do. Rely on asynchronous communication to get this sort of decoupling. But it also needs to be decoupled in space, and, and that's what gives us distribution and mobility, okay? And as, as essentially leaves, leads to resilience and things like that. I also believe, I learned the hard way, that em we need to embrace the network, you know? We need, to, we need to make the network first class in the programming model, okay? We need to embrace the constraints of distributed computing, embrace the constraints of network programming. Don't try to hide it like we've done as an industry way too many times in the past. You know, the fallacies of RPC, Steven Oski can tell you all about that, EGBs, CORBA, DCOM, etc. I mean, we learned the hard way that that creates leaky abstractions that leaks so much that they become almost useless because they hide the hard things and they hide also the opportunities for managing failure. That's, that's one of the problems. Try to pretend that, we, that the network doesn't exist. I think the, uh, the, we, should, we should do it the other way. We should embrace the network and, and live and breathe it. You know? Embrace the constraints because that gives us more headroom for, or, or, or more knobs to turn when it comes to building resilient systems. And the actor model does it right because it makes distribution first class, which is the key in my opinion. Actors are great for a lot of things, I mean, but, but uh, concurrency, etc. Like, but, uh, but I think the key thing is that it, it doesn't try to fake that it's running on network. It takes the other way around. You know this, the Waldo paper, the note on distributed computing. It really tries to, 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 to tackle it head on instead of, of trying to fake it. And location transparency concept that I've found extremely useful here. <coughs> that, that gives us one communication abstraction across all dimensions of scale. So uh, in, in practice, it gives us one programming model with unified semantics, regardless on which level you're attacking the problem. Okay? So, uh, so the instead of so relying on different tools and different semantics for, 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 each, for each level, for example, if you run on a single core, some people might reach for callbacks, you know, doing interleaving on a single core. If you have multi-core, some people then, oh, just use threads and locks, you know, or whatever, it's MPI or something like that. And, and if you have across machines, yeah, then you bring in some message queue or something, message or into middleware or, or RPC or something like that. So you have different tools for different levels. The problem here, then you lock yourself, you hard code the program to be locked into a, a certain topology which in, in dynamic systems, and especially taking advantage of the cloud computing, is just is extremely unfortunate. Because, uh, because I mean, cloud computing promises you know, elasticity, and then we need, we need the components to be able to scale you know, as the systems is being used. From single core to multi-core to multi-node, et cetera, and be moved around. So, so we, re we really need you know, abstractions that allows us, gives us the same way of thinking with the same semantics apart from latency, perhaps, across, you know, from core to socket to CPU to container to server to rack to data center to global, etc. And I believe message passing, asynchronous message passing, asynchronous communication is really the key here because that, uh, that, that that's al allows for that. It gives us one programming model that we can use regardless. We haven't locked ourselves in. And this is what I believe is, is sort of the essence of, of location transparency. We also need to sort of fo focus on resi resilient protocols. And, and, and what I mean by that is, yeah, depend on asynchronous communication, eventual consistency. Protocols that are tolerant to message loss, message reordering, and message duplication. And one thing that's sort of come up the last years, I think it's actually it was Pat Helen that, that came up with the acronym, is ACID 2.0. 
So this is also a framework to think about when you design uh, protocols. It's sort of a funky, you know, variation of you know ACID that sort of you know strong consistency from from the database world. But with a change that A stands for associative. Associative means that it's batch in 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 insensitive. It's grouping insensitive. Okay. Commutative means that it's order insensitive. Order doesn't matter. You know, e idempotent is means that it's duplication insensitive. You can duplicate things, etc. It doesn't matter. And the D are probably just distributed, or just to make them the acronym work. The important thing is we should not strive for guaranteed delivery because that's a hoax, and transactional semantics. Okay. Another th another tool that I found useful that we use in Akka, you know, React, etc. is 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 in in, in, in Kazan, right? so the the Dynamo uh, sort of idea of of a, of, a no, of a node ring. This gives us the possibility to build completely decentralized architecture that are masterless, so peer to peer based, that where you don't have a single point of failure and no single point of bottleneck. And the interesting thing here is that using then gossip protocols. Sort of also sort of inspired by by nature here, yeah, where, where you use sort of epidemic gossiping, it sort of uh, means sort of try to mimic, you know, how how viruses spread, essentially in among humans, etc. Uh, and and these and these sort of gossiping can have like all kinds of data, you know, membership data, you know, metadata. A lot of people use like CRDTs nowadays, you know, to to actually have have have. Uh, have the business-related data sort of spread across the network, etc., which, which is quite interesting. This also gives us a structured way to do failure de detection. Uh, uh, that's a whole topic by itself. There are many ways of looking at it, but but I really believe this is a core principle that you need to have part of it. It's also very important to understand. I've been, 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 been sort of going back to this before that strong consistency is really the wrong default. It's just too brittle. I mean, how many people here have used XA and, and, and would it come back to bite you in the ass? Yeah, it's just, it's really, really hard to make that work. Essentially because you try to shoehorn the world into an illusion that's just wrong. No, it's not how the world works. The, or the world is not strongly consistent. It's something, it's something we, compu we sci computer scientists have made up to try to make things simpler. And in the simple case, you know, it works. But as soon as you just try to tackle hard problems, it usually just falls apart. And, you know, Pat Helen once said that two-phase commit is the anti-availability protocol. And I believe that we have to rely on eventual consistency. Eventual consistency is sort of a probably too broad category to be useful, but, but the solution is often to be found somewhere in there, you know. But it's nothing to be surprised though, because it's really how the world works. It's we humans act, a, you know, using eventual consistency all the time. So we shouldn't fight reality, we should embrace it, we embrace the constraints, and things will be easier. Causal consistency, for example, is, is in my opinion often what good enough, right? It's what people you know, causality is how we, pe how we, how we people sort of interact with each other all the time. So causal consistency is actually probably good enough that you can do quite a lot with when it comes to scale and availability. But some people might think, but I really need transactions. I just can't see a way out of the problem if I then I'll yeah, I'll give you a quote with Pat Helen again. He says like in general application developers simply do not implement large scalable applications assuming distributed transactions. So, so what should we do then if we have to have sort of transactional semantics? Or, 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 or so yeah, 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 Grace Hopper once said, it's easier to ask for forgiveness than it is to, to get permission. So what do we do when we, don't, when we can't coordinate something with someone in real life? Okay. When we can't be certain about something? We usually take an educated guess that, uh, that some sort of property will hold. And if we're wrong, we apologize, you know? And we hopefully do some sort of compensating action once we've asked forgiveness. Yeah, flowers to the wife or something like that, you know? And this, this very much matches reality. It matches how the world works all around us. I mean, other examples, you know, airlines, they try to, you know, they usually overbook flights on purpose and then try to bribe themselves out of the problem by issuing vouchers, et cetera. 
There's also, you know, taking a bet, the whole plane will not fill up, apologize, and then issue compensating action. Same thing with ATMs. They, I mean, if they, if they can't reach the mainframe, they still allow you to, to de deduct money because the money is making money. So the bank is making money from that. And if, if, you, if it turned out you didn't have the money in, in your account, you will, I mean, once the connection is restored, I mean, we will deduct it to a negative balance. And, and you know, if, and if necessary, they will take legal actions afterwards. I mean, it's also, apologize, probably not, but at least take compensating actions. <laughs> So Patelin also said that the, so the subset, the, so the, sorry, the truth is a, is a log. A database is a cache of the subset of the log. You know, disk space used to be very expensive, but today, and, this are, so and that's the reason why SQL databases use in-place update, destructive updates, so re overriding any history that was there. But today, disk space is extremely cheap. So there's really no reason to use in-place update any longer. There's no reason to not keep all history around forever, I believe. So why work with the cache of a subset when you can work with the real thing? And I really believe that we don't need update and delete any longer. We should just you know, create facts as they arrive into the system as how we derive them from other facts or read at any point. And, and, and something that works really, really well when it comes to this, is event logging. You know, working with facts, working with immutable values, store facts in causal order, the order that they have been created in an event log. And event sourcing is starting to be popularized the last years, and it's a, it's a great pattern on top of event logging. Because, you know, the, the log is sort of a database of the past. It allows time travel. The time is a very useful index, you know? So you can actually go back in time and, re and replay and things. So that this opens up things like replay on failure. If one node no crashes, you can just bring it up, replay from where it was, bring it up to, s to speed again. You can also use this sort of replay to have things like, you know, bulletproof auditing, bulletproof debugging, just replay and see what happens, you know? And, and, and for replication, for active and passive replication, you can have any number of, of, of subscribers to this event log to doing many, very many di di different things. Event logging is also extremely per 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 performant. I mean, it uses the single writer principle, having a single component just writing sequentially to disk, very much mapping how modern hardware looks and works, M removing you know, contention. Contention is the biggest scalability killer, really. Trying to remove something like that is extremely important. It also gives us the possibility to have, uh, have what is called a memory image, that you work with data in memory. And, you, you know, ob avoiding this, this sort of classic object-oriented relational impedance mismatch. Since, since you can work with data in memory backed by the event log on disk, you don't need to map anything. The data is fully persistent, because it's replayed, you know, instantly. You often you're using some sort of snapshotting in between because you can't replay like on day one. If you want to know them, the technical ways, I would probably do this. But the interesting thing is you can work with the data in the optimal format in the object without having to worry about any mapping or anything like that. And a lot of people use CQRS on top of event sourcing as a way of separating the writes from the reads. You know, the read side and the write side are often very different resilience characteristics, scalability characteristics and being able to scale them and, and, and provide availability, you know, independent of each other is a really good thing. It also g gives us a way, you know, from the read side to like many types of read side to consume, to subscribe on, on, on the source of truth being the event log in many different sort of formats. One, for example, goes into Elasticsearch for, for, for querying. One goes into SQL database for reporting and you do, you do m most of the queries using Cassandra, for example. So it gives you a lot of different options for both scale and, and, and resilience. Finally, you know, I think it's very important to apply back pressure all the way through. Because you know, if you have a fast producer, it can easily overwhelm a slow consumer and, 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 and take him down. I mean, if he can't keep up, I mean, either I mean, memory might go up or he might starve other processors or something. You know, it's extremely important, especially today, you know, with streaming being sort of a core trait in a lot of applications, 
to, to have a way for the, for, for the slow consumer to signal up the chain how fast the producer can go. So you have a steady flow in the system, sort of steady state, steady state, you know, in terms of, 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 how, how of, of, of streaming. And it's really important that everyone participates, else it will go something like this. That's clearly a, a, a sort of system that, that has a need for back pressure for fishermen. And this is also the reason for standardization efforts around this. I mean, we, we at Lightbin, we created uh, a standard called reactive streams. That's, that's only currently, it's actually not only, there are implementations in some other languages, but it's mainly for Java. It's a simple way to serve an SPI for different sort of libraries to participate underneath how data flows. It's also a, a reactive socket implementation, reactive socket.io, for example, that allows you to do that across the network, etc. So I've covered a lot. T 35 seconds left, according to my count. Uh, but to, 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 to sum things up, I think the, the important things to remember is that complex systems always run as broken systems. Okay? Something in the complex system, which most software systems are, is always failing somewhere. Okay, even if you haven't realized it yet. And w the only way to deal with this is not try to prevent it, it's to embrace it, to make it par part of the essence of your application. And resilience is really by design. It's how you build systems from ground up. So without resilience, nothing else matters really. Uh, I have a whole bunch of reference here if you're interested, if you're liking ac academic papers and reading material. I'll post the slides afterwards, so go off and read it. Thank you, that's all I had. We can take two questions for Kenneth sets up. I couldn't help it, nothing else matters. <laughs> <laughs> we can take them asynchronously. <laughs> I have a question. Sure. You told me that you need to design your system to embrace the failures, right? Mm -hmm. But what is a failure? A failure is something unexpected. So how can you design to handle unexpected? How can you, how can you design to handle the un the unexpected? Yeah, that's a good th that that's a good thing. But it's it's of course of course hard to think through all the failure scenarios, right? But but I think I mean looking at failures as messages mean that that that's at least in something like Scala they are typed. You know they have semantic information. So 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 I'd, I see. I mean try to think through the failure cases and and and, and give them names, give them semantics, make sure that all the context needed sort of is part of the message, so whoever is on the other side, receiving side, knows what to do. Then actually the way um, for finding and mining all the failures, that's sort of a more of a testing problem, I believe. There are like things like Chaos Monkey and stuff, you know. We have a lot of tools in Akka for di distributed testing. You can, you can kick off a bunch of nodes, you have a testing, what we call conductor, that can conduct the tests. And, and that tries to, you know, if possible, run things on a single thread to make things a little bit more de deterministic, if that's what you want, or, or, or just, you know, try to, like, introduce uh, randomness uh, to, to, to try to find failures, if that's what you want. So, so you test the whole spectrum. N I mean Netflix has a bunch of tools for that, for example. You know, the, the chaos, uh, the, the simian army, I think it's called. So uh, I'll start with trying to think through the test cases, but then, then also beat the crap out of the system to make sure I, I, I find all the cases. Which we'll never do, by the way. It will always be something that you never thought about, right? So there needs to be a, a path that deals with the unexpected as well, whatever that might be. Any other questions? Uh, I'll be around here for today, so uh, please don't hesitate to come up and and give me sort of both rants or praise. I appreciate it, thank you.